Well, this morning is part two in our Christmas Advent series. Now, if you remember, last week we focused on the name of Christ, and we're looking at four different names that were given to him. He shall be called in his various titles. Last week, the focus was on Emmanuel, which means God with us. Because God is with us, we have hope. Because God is with us, we have companionship. And because God came in the flesh, we have an example to follow. Now this morning, we're focusing in on another name of Christ. That is Wonderful Counselor. I'm going to give us the sermon in a sentence, and this is what it is. Jesus came just as he was promised to a people with problems to give us counsel and to make us whole. That's what we are talking about today. So we're turning again to Isaiah chapter 9. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. I'm going to hit a number of passages, of course. And if you're following along, obviously take notes. And these things will be back up online. The notes will be there as well at uh, crosspointrockford.com. You can see these things there. So Isaiah chapter 9. This was the prophetic birth announcement that was given approximately eight Hundred years before this child actually showed up. Starting with verse 6 of chapter 9 of Isaiah. For to us, and I want you to personalize this, for to you, a child is born. And to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So a question for us. <laughs> Who gives a birth announcement 800 years before this child takes their first breath of air? And when doing so, gives a list of their titles, and all the things they're going to accomplish. Can you imagine that? Now, those of you who have children, and often we give birth announcements that we celebrate saying, for instance, our oldest daughter, his name, is this me or is it just here? I'm sorry. Okay, we're okay? Okay. <laughs> this is my pack, maybe it's myself. One, two. I'll try not to move. Okay. It's going to be my first, first statue sermon. <laughs> Let's go back. So we're, those of you who have children, what's that? Sorry, everybody, we're having some microphone issues. Maybe you just got it fixed. Sounds like we're okay. Okay, I'm going to continue. <laughs> All right. So imagine those of you who had children, and in excitement, we give our birth announcements out, proclaiming that a child has been brought into the world. And so we have two children, and when Anna, our firstborn, was to arrive, we told the world, here she is. Her name is Anna Marie. Okay, I'm going to use this. Okay, Anna Marie Spooner. I'll hold this here. Okay, here we go. You know I can't talk as well with my, without my hands, so I'm just going to tell you this. No, just kidding. And so no parent announces 
the accomplishments of that child before that child is born. Right. Could you imagine, you know, here's our daughter. Her name is Anna. She is a violin virtuoso. She is a nurse extraordinaire. She is a mother extreme. She is a friend to the friendless. We can't announce our children that way because we don't know. No one gives their resume of their child when they introduce them. At that point, all Anna had done is showed up, blinked, cried, and a few other things that children do. Okay? We don't know what's going to take place when a child is born. However, this birth announcement of this child was different, saying, I want to give you Heads up. I want to give you a warning. I want to make this announcement of this child. Now, this child won't come on the scene, and they did not know that until the child did come on the scene 800 years later. But in this announcement, it was proclaimed his titles, who he would be, what he would do. That should blow your mind. Who can do that besides God Almighty? No one. This child will be the wonderful counselor. This child is mighty God. This child is everlasting father. This child will be the prince of peace. The zeal of the Lord Almighty can accomplish this because he knows all things. Later on in Isaiah chapter 46, this is declared about God. He says this about himself, for I am God. There is no other. I am God. There are none like me. Then he goes on and says, this is what I can do that no one else can do. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purposes. You know the difference between you and God? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? You may think in generalizations you'll be correct as in the sun will rise tomorrow. Way to go, Einstein. That's a very brilliant prediction. We know in general that more than likely we'll get up in the morning. We know in general that our cars will start. We know in general what will happen. But we do not know specifics of anything. I don't even know what's all going to happen this day. Not just in my life, but no way can you or I predict all the things that are going to happen on this world this day. We have a very, very limited understanding. We have a very limited knowledge of what may take place. But this is not how it is with God. God is completely different than us. Transcendent other. And yet he came to us and he made us and he is with us. But God says, I know how everything's going to turn out. I know from the beginning of when he spoke things into creation, and he knows the ending where he makes all things new. He knows from eternity past to eternity future all things. And he says, there's no one like me. There is no God like me because I am the only true God. Now, if you want counsel from someone, often we don't know that we don't know the future. And so we debate and we um, wring our hands and we wonder. But the great counselor doesn't wonder. And you think that if someone was giving you counsel who knew everything that was to come, that their counsel would be good counsel, right? Because we can trust when he says, hey, don't worry, okay? He means it with authority. This is what this wonderful counselor term means. That he is above all things so he can lead us through all things. And he tells us over and over and over again in scripture to trust me, to trust me, to trust me. Why is he worthy of trust? 
because he knows all things and he's above all things. And when he gives us counsel, it can be trusted because God knows what he's talking about. This is God. So he can declare in this 800 year birth announcement exactly what this child will accomplish and who this child is. There is no one like him. So Jesus came just as he was promised at the exact moment of God's delight and of God's design. Wonderful counselor, which indicates that Jesus will be a supernatural source of extraordinary wisdom. Now, this is amazing news for those who need guidance. Mighty God, which indicates that Jesus will be divinely strong and powerful. This is amazing news for those who are weak. Everlasting Father, which indicates that Jesus will care for his people forever as a father cares for his children. This is amazing news for those who are alone and unappreciated. Prince of Peace which indicates that Jesus will bring deep well-being and right relationships. Amazing news for all of us who lack peace with each other and with God. He was announced to be these things. He was these things. And will continue to be these things forever. Jesus came just as he was promised. And Jesus came for people with problems. Now, is there anyone out there and anyone here who has problems? Okay, I think we can raise our hands, right? The good news is, Jesus came for you. Jesus came for you. Jesus came for us. He didn't come to people who didn't have problems. I and you have problems of things that are bigger than us. And issues that we do not know how to handle. I have good news for you today. That Jesus came for you. And Jesus came for me. He did not come for people who had it all together. He came to those who are confused and burdened and dismayed and in desperate need of help. And as was mentioned in the Advent reading, we purposely tie these things together. That every miracle Jesus accomplished started with a problem. I want you to think about this. Okay? There was a problem in people's physical bodies. I.e., for example, the problem was they couldn't see. So a miracle occurred to bring sight to the blind. There was a problem with a man who was paralyzed, could not move, and Jesus came to bring life to the whole person. There were problems when people were dead and in sorrow and Jesus brought new life. Now there were problems as they wanted to get from one side of the lake to the other side and a storm arose. Opportunity for Christ to perform a miracle. There were people who had been three days gathering to hear Jesus in a far distant country with no longer any food. And they were hungry and they had to go back. There was a problem. Jesus came and performed a miracle there as well. Every 
miracle started with a problem. If you need understanding, he will give it. If you need to know the truth, he is it. If you need to know the way, follow him. And if you desire to overcome sin and death, he is the only one who can give it to you. He is a light in darkness. He is the strength for the weak. He is the help for the troubled. He is wisdom for the confused. There is no one like him. Jesus came to people with problems. And he invites us to engage with him. He doesn't wait for us to go to him. He comes to us. And he's here with us by his spirit. Jesus came to give us counsel. He is the wonderful counselor. A God whose goodness goes beyond words. The counselor who knows everything perfectly. Remember that. The beginning to the end. The counselor that gave his life for you. The one you can trust. Jesus is the authoritative guide. He is the one that can guide you through everything. Remember this because he is above everything. And he invites us to ask him for counsel. This is an open invitation given to us in James chapter 1 that says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, right? Have you ever lacked wisdom? Okay. Every day, right? So this is the invitation of the great counselor who's available to you that you have access to. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him, let her ask God. Who gives generously to all without reproach? And it, the wisdom, will be given to them. So stand in faith when you ask. It's ours for the asking, this wisdom from the wonderful counselor. And it comes to us through his words whispered and given by his spirit. Psalm 119 gives us this image. It says, your word, which is the word incarnate, which is the word breathed by the spirit, which is the written word, the logos of God. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Lamp to your feet. God's word and God's spirit and the wonderful counselor, if you don't know what to do, will show us the next step to take. Is a lamp to my feet. And sometimes all we know and all we need is the next step. And the next step. His word is a lamp to our feet, but also a light to our path. He tells us the next step we should take, but also shows us the direction in which we are to travel. Lamp for our feet and a light for our path. The question is not, God, do you hear me? But the question is, are we asking and do we hear him? Christ, Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. The wisdom of God, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And wisdom and knowledge are treasures that have been hidden in Christ and are there for us to behold and to ask and to seek and to go after. God will instruct you, Psalm 32, and teach you in the way you should go. 
I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Not only does God know the future, but he knows you. Right? He knows what's taking place outside of us, and he knows what's taking place within inside of us. He counsels us because he loves us. And he's qualified to counsel us because he is the wonderful counselor who knows all things. And he is almighty God. How foolish is it for us to spurn his counsel and think that we know better than God. Have you ever done that before? I have done that before. Right? What a foolish thing. For me, only born a short 47 years ago, to think I know better than the God who exists eternally. <laughs> Foolish. So I implore you, I challenge you, to take and seek the counsel of the Almighty God. Jesus, the Word becoming flesh. What would you do? What would you say? What are you, how are you leading me? Take his counsel. Now, around this time, every single year, and as long as I am pastor here, you will hear this from me. It is time for you to start to think about the new year. Okay? And I implore you, I tell you to get into the word of God this year. Okay? This isn't something you need to pray about or think about. Like God's going to say, nah, don't, don't read my word. I really didn't mean that, right? He's not going to say that. I read the Bible and have been reading the Bible every year since I'm 17 through. I have a plan. I'm disciplined in this, okay? Why? I don't do it because I'm a pastor. I do it because I'm a person, right? I'm a son who needs guidance, and all of us need to be reminded of his word. The number one way you are going to grow spiritually, how you're going to grow in wisdom, how you're going to grow in maturity, how you're going to become more like Christ, the number one way is if you read the word for yourself. If you make goals for this next year, make your first goal is this. I want to be more like Christ. In order to do that, this is how you do it. You read his word. In order to do that, you get his word. You understand what was sacrificed for us to have the word in a language we can understand. We have some of the best translators in the world, and people have died to give us this word. It is the treasure that we have, and how often we put it down, and we spend more time... With Facebook, we spend more time with our sports interests. We spend more time with our friends or with our family or with our hobbies. And we forsake the very counsel and word of God. So here's the deal. If you said, well, I've never read the Bible before. Let this year be your year. And if you say, well, I know the Bible well, does the Bible know you well? It's not just coming to church, it's being the church. Read the word, get a plan. There's a myriad of them out there. You can get an app, and I read, on, uh, I read this, and I read this, and there are apps. A U version is a great one. All of these versions, free of charge, download it, put it in, get a plan, they're there for you. This is the counsel of God. <laughs> read it and allow it. Read you and you will grow. I guarantee you this. Jesus came as he was promised. Jesus came to people with problems. Jesus came to give us counsel and Jesus came to make us well. Now notice that I did not say that Jesus came to make us feel better. 
there is a huge difference between feeling better and being made well or being made whole. Grab your Bible, turn over to the Gospel of John. This is the last passage we will examine before we receive communion. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. Jesus was ministering. The crowds were following him. His renown was becoming known throughout the area. The disciples were curious. They were learning. And people lined up to hear this man and to receive from him. <clears throat> now, he was in Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, there was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five color covered colonnades. These were these porch areas, kind of like a gazebo around a pool. is a public place there in the heart of the city. Now, at this place, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind were there. The lame were there. The paralyzed were there. Now, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. This was a long-standing continuous issue for this man. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now let's pause right there. On first glance, it seemed like an insulting question. Right? What do you mean, do I want to get well? <laughs> you understand I've been lying here? 38 years? We have to ask ourselves, why did Jesus ask that question? You would assume that all the people there in that area, all the people who are struggling in some form with some type of disability, something that was a problem, that all of them would want to get rid of the problem. But the deal is that well, that's not true. Not everyone with a problem wants to overcome it because often we start to identify ourselves with an area or an issue in our life and that becomes our identity. And that becomes our community. And that becomes our condition that we have become comfortable in. Now Jesus did not ask this man, do you want to be healed? Do you want to feel better? That's not the question. A completely different Greek word. He asked him not, do you want to be healed? He asked him, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? A completely different question. And feeling better and being better is a completely different process. For example, if you have ever broken a bone or say, I fall off of these stairs and break my arm, right? And so I have to go to the hospital. Now, they can make me feel better pretty easily. Know how they do that? It's called morphine, right? <laughs> Boom. I'm happy, 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 right? I feel better even though my arm is broken. I'm happy, right? Now, feeling better typically can be instantaneous. And a lot of people settle for just feeling better better versus getting better or being well. We medicate ourselves because of our pain, and it comes in various forms. It can come through drugs, right? not feeling good, not being able to handle life or whatever's going on, and I just want to feel better. And if you get a shot, if you take a hit, if you do these things, you will feel better, but you're not well. 
Or we medicate ourselves in various ways. They don't feel good, so I'm going to scroll on something, or I'm going to click on something, or I'm going to go buy something, or I'm going to go do something. And yes, will you feel better? You will. For a moment. But you will not be better. Feeling better is easy. It's immediate. It relieves pain. It relieves pressure. It's temporary. And it deals with felt needs. Being better is harder. It's gradual. It may cause pain. We have to be active in it. It's permanent. And it meets a real need. So if I went to the doctor with my broken arm, right, they can make me feel better instantaneously. But in order to get better, that's a whole different process, right? They may need to then cause some pain by resetting the bone and then cause more discomfort by placing my arm in a cast, which is inconvenient. It's hot and it's itchy sometimes and I, it restricts my motion. And it takes a long time for this being made whole process to happen. And then after the bone is set and things have healed, the muscles atrophy, so therefore they cut it off and I have to work at it and to stretch and to build strength and to go through therapy and give myself to a process. And then at the other end, I have been made whole. Jesus does not just offer us to, be, to feel better. He says, do you want to be made whole? Okay. This is beyond our physical being. He's talking also about our spiritual lives, our mental, our emotional, made whole. When God addresses a temporary felt need, he does so to deal with our eternal, real need. Okay. So when he was asking this man, do you want to be made whole? He had a choice to make. And we have a choice to make as well. And often we just seek Christ to feel better. God, I have a problem here. Can you help me with my relationship? Can you help me with my money? Can you help me with, at work? Can you help in this circumstance here? Because it bothers us. I want to encourage you to think beyond your temporal need, to think about the real need. God, I pray that in this situation that you will work all things to your glory and good, and in this I can honor you. God, I trust you, and the finances are good, but God, I'm trusting in you, and God, will you help my faith to stay strong? God, not only do I want reconciliation with my son, with my daughter, but God, I want them to have reconciliation with you. That you would change them from the inside, not just change temporal, external circumstances. And so God asks us that question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? So this question of Jesus to this paralytic was not insulting, but it was revealing. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? So this man replied in verse 7 of John 5, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into this pool, and the belief was, if you go into this pool, you'll be healed. He says, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here not to, not to just beg, not for a community. I'm here because I want to be made whole, but I have no one to help me. And when I'm trying to get in, I've tried. Year after year, I've tried, but I can't move, and I'm not fast enough, and I, I can't get there. But I'm still here, and I'm trying. Someone else goes down ahead of me. It was obvious that this man wanted to be made whole, and Jesus knew this. So he said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, walk. At once the man was cured. 
He picked up his mat and walked. Now, he just didn't do everything for him, but he made it possible for him to be made whole. And now he had a responsibility to get up, get out of this circumstance and walk, move ahead. Go forward. Leave this place. Jesus did not just come to make us feel better. Jesus came to make us whole, to make us whole. The great counselor came as he promised to people with problems to give us counsel and to make us whole. Jesus is the only one that can do these things. Things and he invites us into relationship with him. This child, this Emmanuel, this wonderful counselor who is available to us, offers to us an opportunity to be made whole mind, spirit, body, emotions. And it will come at various times. And it will all come at once at the very end. We don't get everything we want and the time we want, but it will happen in the end. Wait for it. Trust Him. Seek Him. Pick up your mat and walk. So in conclusion, and we're going to go to communion right now, Jesus again came as he was promised to a people with problems. Came as he was promised. I want you to personalize this. To a people with problems. I qualify. You qualify. To give us counsel. You need counsel. You seek the great counselor. Not just make us feel better, but to make us whole. Jesus is to us the wisdom from God. And not only that, He is righteousness, making us right with God. And sanctification, changing us and conforming us into the image of His Son. He is redemption. From sin and death, there's no one like him. So that, as it is written, of those who boast about what God has done, what God is doing, what God will do, let them boast in the Lord. He has done amazing and marvelous things. Acknowledge him. Seek him. Him. Praise Him. Walk in Him with the obedience of faith.